Eric and Lyle Menendez, the infamous brothers. The savagery of their crime, the murders of both their mother and father, seem beyond comprehension. Tonight, for the very first time out of court, you will hear their story. Tonight, watching our interview, you can reach your own verdict about them. We begin with the crime itself. A hot August night in 1989, the Beverly Hills mansion of entertainment executive Jose Menendez. He and his wife Kitty are watching television in the family room. Suddenly, a brutal volley of shotgun fire. Jose Menendez is killed by a close-in shot to the head. He has five other shotgun wounds. Kitty Menendez's body is riddled with shotgun pellets. She had 10 wounds on her. She was getting blasted all over that room. Don't kill my parents. Pardon me? Don't kill my parents. Uh, were they shot? Yes. They were shot? Yes. The voice of Lyle Menendez, then 21 years old, who tells police that he and his brother Eric, then 18, discovered the bodies as they returned home from a movie. Lyle and Eric Menendez lied successfully for months. But if their crime was a horror movie, their undoing was the stuff of soap opera. Eric, in torment, confessed his crime to his therapist, Dr. Jerome Ozeal. Lyle then also admitted to the murders. Their confession was overheard by Ozeal's mistress, Judalon Smith, and she went to the police. Lyle was arrested in California. Eric, who had been traveling overseas, voluntarily flew home to surrender. Three years later, the Menendez brothers went on trial for their lives. I was just firing as I went into the room. I just started firing. In what direction? In front of me. What was in front of you? My parents. And I remember firing directly at them. You reloaded? Is that yes? Yes. And what did you do after you reloaded? I ran around and shot my mom. This is the woman who gave birth to them. This is what they did to their mother. The jury and heard tapes of the brother's confession to Dr. Ozeal. When their turn came, Eric and Lyle Menendez told a rapt courtroom that the murder of their parents was an act of self-defense. They said they were in fear of their lives from a controlling father who had been sexually abusing them. He raped me. Did you cry? Yes. Did you bleed? Yes. Were you scared? Very. Lyle said his abuse stopped when he was eight, but that he didn't know until yes. just before the murders that Eric was being molested too. What do you believe was the originating cause of you and your brother ultimately winding up shooting your parents? Um, me telling. You telling what? Me telling Lyle that, uh... You telling Lyle what? <laughs> was it you telling Lyle about something that was happening? My dad. My dad had been molesting me. The brother's testimony was compelling and effective. Relatives testified on their behalf about incidents in which their father treated the sons harshly, though none of them could actually confirm the allegations of sexual abuse. The jurors could not decide between verdicts of murder and manslaughter. I find that the jury is hopelessly deadlocked and uh, the court declares a mistrial. In August of 1995, now six years after their parents' murders, the Menendez brothers went on trial again. This time, there were no video cameras. Eric testified, but Lyle chose not to. Judge Stanley Weisberg again presided, but in a major blow for them, limited the brothers' claims to self-defense. There were far fewer grounds this time for a possible verdict of manslaughter. The jury deliberated for less than four days. The verdict? Lyle and Eric Menendez, both guilty of first-degree murder. The jury spent three more days deciding between life and death. The verdict here was life, in prison with no parole. 
The Menendez brothers have spent more than six years in this building, the Los Angeles County Jail. Eric lives in the identical cell next to this one. It measures seven and a half by nine feet. Lyle's cell in another wing of the jail is slightly smaller. Both brothers are segregated from the general population. Each of the brothers separately is allowed up to three hours of exercise a week on the jail's roof. Eric and Lyle Menendez will be moved to state prison, perhaps even to separate prisons, this summer. Our interview took place in the jail's administrative wing, some distance from their cells. You may find Eric and Lyle Menendez to be cunning and manipulative, as their second jury seems to have, pronouncing them guilty of first-degree murder. Or like many of the jurors at their first trial, you may decide that they are credible and that their story strikes a sympathetic chord. That is perhaps for you to determine. My job was to ask the questions, beginning with this one. What went through your minds when you heard that verdict? First degree murder, guilty. That I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison uh, without any possibility of ever getting released. And uh, you, you just, you're devastated. I was devastated. Could have been death. Did you think that? I was terrified that that they would give either one of us uh, death, and that's, a, that's scary. It's important to you to stay together when you get moved to the state prison? Very important. That is what's gotten us through these six years, and, and through our life. Um, I, the family that Eric and I grew up in, we had to be there for each other throughout, and it really created a bond that that gets us through very rough periods. Some people might say, why should we put them together? I mean, look what they did. They should be punished as much as possible. Let's separate them. What do you say to that? You know people will say that, some. Um, there's, n there's nothing to say to that. Um, what we did it was awful, um, and I wish I could go back. We will spend the rest of our life in prison. But if I'm not, if I'm not, if we're not put in the same prison, uh, there's a good probability I will never see him again. And, and that, uh, that I, some things that you cannot take and there's some things that you can endure uh, with everything taken away, it would be the last, you know, it's the last thing you can take. Do you think the media has portrayed you fairly? Can you tell? I, I don't know if anyone can be portrayed fairly in the media, who they are. Well, let me say it. There are people, a great number of people, who think that you two are spoiled brats, that you are evil, that you are monsters. What do you say to them? That's not who I am, but I can't defend that. Because I came from a family of wealth, it doesn't make me spoiled. I would be surprised if anybody that was present at that trial and, uh, and saw the whole thing, rather than snippets on the news, uh, would feel that. A jury found you both guilty. Right, but I don't think you aren't guilty because they found you spoiled. Mm -hmm. um, or evil. Or evil. Yeah. Just a normal... I'm just a normal kid. Oh, Eric, you're a normal kid who killed your parents. Yeah, I know. And you still say you're a normal kid? Well, I, I didn't have normal experiences, but I, I am. I, I, I did that, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what happened and wish that I could, I could take that moment back or change what happened. But uh, it... It's, it's hard to live with that. Do you feel remorse? Tremendous remorse. Um, and I think... Uh, There's tremendous pain. I mean, from the second that I got back to the house after the shootings, I saw what happened and I said, this is wrong. This is awful. How could this have happened? I what? couldn't accept it. You couldn't accept it, but you called the police? You pretended that you hadn't done it. 
you, you cried, you went off on a spending spree. I mean, we all read about it. You bought Rolexes, you bought cars, you bought... You didn't say, oh my God, what have I done, and turn yourself in. Well, that's not, uh, that's not really what Well, I've sort of stuck it all together, <laughs> but... Yeah, you did a good job at it. Uh, we got back to the house, the police were there, and uh, it was a matter of, 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 of telling him you did it or, or just saying, I don't know who did it. And that's what we did. And uh, if I could go back, perhaps I'd say I did it. And part of that started from the fact that we waited afterwards and the police did not come. And in, the, in that time that we waited and waited, you know, we did make a bad decision to not have to... We expected the police to be there. I mean, You expected the police to the come middle, there and arrest you? Twelve shots in the middle of Beverly Hills on a Sunday night, and no one calls the police. We're waiting at the house. No one shows up. And I, I still can't believe it. So you call the police, but at that point, you had already decided... We had decided not to... That you weren't going to say anything. We were very... Uh, stunned and we felt that um, we would go to jail obviously and, and we it was a selfish reason to just not want to have to to go through that what about spending the money you know the cars watches invested in businesses the good life well it was it was the same life uh, before or afterwards with more money with with more money but i didn't know what to do with the money i went to it got to a point where i have i have all this money and so much pain, I don't know what to do with it. And eventually... I don't know, you're losing me. I would think that you would be in such grief that you wouldn't be able to buy Rolexes and invest in businesses. I don't... Explain I don't, to me, let me understand. I'm, you know, I'm the public. I don't think that it's understandable. I mean, I... People react to a, some traumatic event like that in different ways. You went to your psychologist, Dr. Ozeal, and told him that you had committed this crime. It got to a point where I could no longer live. I felt that I was the worst person on earth, and I, 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 it got to a point where I couldn't live with myself anymore, and I needed help. And so I went to him, and that is what the catalyst was for me getting arrested in Lyle. You've had a lot of therapy. Six years of intense therapy. How are you different than the man who came in here? I'm six years older. I'm a lot more mature. I came in here as an 18-year-old kid who didn't know anything uh, about what life. What did you learn about yourself? I learned that, that... I learned what love was about. Uh, I learned what love was about because of my grandmother, because of all my relatives who, who didn't say, I can't believe you did this. Instead, they said, Eric, I know who you are. You're not this type of person. You're not the type of person who could do this for no reason. Have you had therapy, Lyle? The same. The same therapy. And um, has, it, it really uh, works to just have someone you can communicate with that's willing to listen. All our lives, uh, it was just sort of fending off things. It almost sounds like prison was a good thing for you. It was. It I was? I mean, at first... I mean, I, I killed my parents, and I spent six months out there in the horrible agony because I had done this. I mean, a, a year before, I told my mother how much I loved her. I could not have imagined doing this even a week before to her. I, I, I adored her. And then suddenly you're arrested, and everyone can know you did it, and you can finally tell people, and it's a relief. Lyle, you're looking at your brother like you almost never heard this before. Tell me how you felt. You know, for me, uh, emotionally being in, in prison conditions was, was really not, emotionally was not a shocking difference from the life we had lived because we, we lived really a very f stressful, fearful life. And to me, the, the, it was kind of like I felt this, I should be punished. And um, it didn't feel good, but there was a part of you that feels like That's right. it's, it's better. You get a lot of mail? We, we still get a, a tremendous amount of mail. Hundreds? We've gotten hundreds, thousands over the years. We asked um, 
your lawyers to give us a sample of some of your letters. A great many of them seem to deal with from people who have been abused themselves and relate to you. Lyle, what do you say to people who write to you? A lot of people that have written were um, very, uh, they, they drew a lot of strength from watching the trial and from, from seeing Eric and I. And, and I, I've gotten mail after the verdict, people discouraged. And I wanted to say to them to not lose hope because of this one case and this one verdict, very unique situation here. And that this is not, does not mean that if they go get help, people won't believe them or people will treat them harshly or they'll be ridiculed. I don't feel they will be. That's not to say do what we did. Don't do yeah. what we did, but don't but be afraid don't of be afraid getting help. People that want to reach out to social workers for help, but are ashamed or afraid. Do you also get love letters? Yeah, some. You find that strange? It's a strange phenomenon that a lot of uh, love letters come in from people that don't know you at all. Do either one of you have girlfriends? Do either one of you have someone who cares particularly about you now at this point in your life? I do. I you have do. someone who uh, I love very much and um, is uh, a saint to put up with everything that comes with this. Can you tell us who she is? Uh, yeah, her name is Anna Erickson and um, I hope that we can, uh, we can get married. Even though it's a very limited relationship because of where we are, the exchange of love and sharing, it keeps you in touch with yourself and, and softer. And, you know, otherwise you can become very uh, hard and cold in here. Is this someone you knew before prison? No. This is this someone is, who began to write I, to you and I, meet you? I wrote, she wrote me many years ago, but uh, and I've come to know her well, but just someone that I met through the mail. And she wants to marry you? And she does. Eric? No, not at the moment. You're I've... not going to meet a lot in prison, Eric. <laughs> No, I probably won't. Uh, it, it's hard. Lyle, Lyle's more able to have uh, that type of relationship. Eric, you know that the prosecutor brought up the fact that you might have been a homosexual and that this might have caused some of the fury on your father's part. Yes, uh, he did. I didn't, I didn't hear about girlfriends. They were there. I guess what I just have to say to you is, are you gay? No. No, the, the prosecutor brought that up because uh, I was uh, sexually molested and he felt in his own thinking that if I was sodomized by my father that I must have enjoyed it and therefore I must be gay and, and the people that are, are gay out there must be sexually molested or they wouldn't be felt and it's a, it was uh, upsetting to hear. Uh, but. I'm not gay, uh, but a lot of gay people write and, and feel connected to me. A problem at the trial was the gender bias that because um, there we were dealing with males and in an incest family that there, there's sort of perceptions that well maybe it was uh, something that he wanted, something that he allowed to happen, um, that he shouldn't be allowed to feel afraid because he's a male. I really felt that people might have seen this case very differently if it were a sister that I was protecting or that was involved in this and not a, a brother. Uh -huh. You know this whole business of abuse excuse, that you were abused by your parents, sexually abused, emotionally abused by this tough, unyielding father. But there are lots of people who are abused sexually and other ways and they don't kill their parents and you've been ridiculed for this abuse excuse. What do you say about it? Abuse excuse is a word that Alan Dershowitz made up not knowing anything about the case. Uh, if, I mean, uh, to simplify it to its simplest degree, if, if, a, if a person is raped, man or woman, and she kills the man who raped her, is it an excuse that the reason she killed him is because she was raped? Of course not. I certainly never felt that what I did was justified or right. It was just a question of how wrong was it. That was a big misperception about this case, that it was about justification or excuse. And my brother and I essentially pled guilty. That was very hard for me to hear the ridicule about that because we, I really felt that Eric and I 
I mean, we could have gone to trial like most people and just sort of, we weren't there, it wasn't Miles. us, and had that trial. We, what do you mean, we could have gone to trial, we weren't there? Well, you could go to trial and just say that I was, uh, you know, chipping golf balls at the time and I wasn't there. And Eric and I went to trial and said, we did ah, this. Ah, there were happened. tapes, there were tapes. Tapes became admissible because we said we did it. Lyle and I fought uh, because he wanted, to, he felt that, that telling the world that dad it was a sexual torturer, was killing dad twice, and he did not want to kill dad twice. And he fought and he said, I don't want to go up there, I'm not going to take the stand, I'm not going to do it. And then when he did, there was a great outpouring, but there was also people laughing at him, and it was strange. Eric, you were able to tell your psychologist that you had killed your parents, but you were not able to tell your psychologist that your father had abused you? Unless you've been molested, you, you can't realize how hard it is to tell. Because of shame? Because of shame. The story continues now, the scene being set for murder. Describe your relationship with your father. What words come into your mind? Brutal. Uh, uh, painful. Uh, torturous. And yet I thought that he was the most powerful and brilliant person I had ever met. I was his firstborn son. That was very important to him. And my bond with him was, I thought, strong because we had been through so much together. But uh, it was difficult to see the things that were going on. And, uh, things that were going on, that is, when you learned that he was sexually molesting your brother? He had sexually molested me before I was a teenager. And um, it was a different, much different experience than Eric's. Because you were little? Because I was little, I guess. You know, there are some questions that everybody asks, like, why didn't you run away? I wish that I could have. I tried to run away when I was 12, and my father found me. Uh, he caught me and said, if you ever run away, I will kill you, I will find you, and I will kill you. Suppose you left and you, I don't know what, became a waiter and moved away. You, you still thought he'd find you? He would find me and probably kill me. I thought for certain he would kill you me. You still think that? Oh, absolutely. Did you love your mother or like your mother? I loved my mother and I tried to help her. My mother was a person in a lot of pain and uh, she was alcoholic and she was suicidal. Did she know about the abuse, the sexual abuse? She knew. And didn't do anything? She knew and uh, it, it doesn't seem that she did anything. Do you still think about the night of the murder? I, every day. You both do? Tell me as clearly as you can why you murdered your parents that night. First thing that comes to mind is terror. Uh, I was so afraid. A few days before, I had said to myself, I'm never going to let my father touch me again. After I told Lyle that it had been continuing on, I, had, I said to myself, I'm never going to let him touch me again. And just before the shootings, my dad told me to get to my room and that he would be there in a minute and I, he was going to come up and there was going to be sex and it was like an explosion in my mind. But you'd bought the guns. It wasn't something that just happened that moment. You'd thought about it. No. You bought the guns in advance. They just weren't in the house. Yes, we, we bought the guns in advance. So, this we didn't just happen that moment. We bought the guns. There was a, there was many, a series of yeah. uh, confrontations and, and blow-ups in the house. My dad, when it first was revealed that I had told Lyle yeah. about the secret, my dad said to Lyle, you're going to tell everyone, and I'm not going to let that happen. Take me through your mind, Lyle. I cannot uh, separate and say, this is why this happened. Uh, I, I've, my father was threatening us, and so there was fear, but there was great, you know, I, there was anger on my part, and um, my mother uh, was aware of and had allied herself with my father, and it was, it, there was a great deal of confusion. This happened all in just three days, and I just, um, I wish, I give anything to just turn back that one page of my life. The other big question. 
you killed your father who was molesting you. Why did you kill your mother? On Thursday night before, uh, when there, in one of the explosions, I was running downstairs and I was crying. And my mother was on the couch and she had been drinking. And she said, what's wrong with you? And I said, nothing, nothing. You wouldn't understand. And she said, oh, I understand. What do you think, I'm stupid? And, and she told me that she knew, that she had known all my life what my father was doing. And it was like I didn't even know who she was anymore. And I just saw dad and mom as the same person at that point. I, I saw them as, as a single person. And really the first time that this secret about what was happening with dad and Eric was discussed openly in the family in a very um, angry way. I don't know about Eric, but I completely lost control myself. And um, I, in that time, I, I didn't separate. I knew my mother and my father. I just. I was just, it was just adrenaline and fear and anger. I, uh, Lost control. No, there is no uh, explanation. There's but you, no, had, no, we don't you, had, one. you had thought about this earlier because you had bought the garden several days before. We knew that this could end, this could, a violent confrontation could occur because my father had threatened my life. You still think your father would have killed you for revealing the secret? You both still feel that? There's no question. Really? Yeah. I, I still believe that. I don't believe that he was in the process of killing us that moment, I that see. evening. Yeah. But uh, I, you know, I, and, I, and I don't think that this, it might seem, because there are so few cases that come to the public's attention like this, that this has never occurred ever before in the country. And in fact, there are over 200 parasites a year that involve incest families. And so, you know, I felt it completely then and now. I believe that, but I would not shoot my parents now, no matter what. How now would you have resolved it? Now, what, almost seven years later? What do you think you should have I would have, done? have never told. I got Lyle into this. I, I'm, I went to him and I said, Lyle, I can't live anymore with what's going on and got him involved. He was way to go. They had bought him a condominium. He was going to Princeton. He had all the money. So it's your fault for telling your brother? It's my fault. And I got him involved and said, I need your help. And then five days later, my parents were dead. So it's your it was, fault? That's completely my fault. He, he was suicidal at the time. And it was just a last thing to reach out. And I, obviously, who was going to reach out to? And we, I decided to confront my father rather than just sort of never, not say anything and just have Eric and I leave, which if I could go back, that's what I would do. I would just say, Eric's old enough now, he wants to leave. Have you forgiven yourself? I don't think it's possible. Lyle, are you at any kind of peace? More so than, uh, than maybe Eric, because at this point, uh, for some reason, he, well before the verdict, I was resigned to bad things. And, um, I have, I think, um, f found a place where I can look forward and try to um, have hope and share myself more with people. And I, I, hope of what? Hope of living a life that I can be more proud of. How and in prison? There are, you're confined, but there, you know, there must be, I, I, even just in writing people that need help. If you can help them and, and, and convince a single person that has been through our situation that the last thing in the world they should do is, is, is act out violently, then you find meaning in your life. If you could say something to your mother and your father, I'm sure you have in your own minds, what would you say? I am so sorry. I forgive them completely for anything they have done to us. If I had one wish, it would be to be able to have one conversation with them or to change places with them. I, I, I hope someday that uh, I can be with them and have uh, some sort of conversation about what happened it is one of the awful things is that I I can't 
we couldn't communicate that weekend, and I still, I can't. And um, just that I, uh, I love them, and um, you know that I believe, despite all, everything that happened, that they really uh, loved us, and that things just uh, went awry. Our interview is over. Deputies now arrive to take Eric and Lyle Menendez back to the cell blocks. They were handcuffed and chained for the long walk back. Their legs had been shackled throughout the interview. This had been one of their infrequent opportunities to see one another in jail. The guards would now take each of them to their separate cells and to the certainty of the rest of their lives in prison. <laughs>